So today we're going to take a deep dive into the importance of innovation and its role in improving food systems to provide nutritious and tasty and healthy foods for all. Why am I moderating this and why is this an important issue for me at the Syngenta Foundation? We're focused on helping uplift and helping uh, low-income smallholders uplift themselves and their communities. If they're going to do that, they need to have markets for healthy foods. And that means that they have a role to play as producers feeding into healthy, nutritious supply chains. But in order to do that, we need people across the entire chains, uh, the entire value chains, from consumers uh, in cities and in towns, uh, through the traders and the processors, through those people running storage, through those people supporting production, uh, to be understanding how diets need to change, how they are changing, and then to be supporting the process of improving the health of the food systems for all. This is a systemic challenge, and that's why this year with the UN Food Systems Summit, there's a huge opportunity for us to use the summit to showcase what good looks like, what the gaps are in many countries between where we are now and what a good, healthy, nutritious food system can be, and then use the summit as a launch pad for change in a positive direction. And a much of that change is gonna come through partnerships. Uh, innovation itself requires innovators, it requires businesses who can distribute and produce those innovations, it requires governments to regulate and offer a level playing field and a competitive landscape, it requires producers to embark on producing things in new ways, using new technologies, producing new crops. And this is a very complex set of challenges and that's what we're going to dive into today. How do we get not just innovations to be produced in laboratories, or by startups, but innovations to be adopted by actors right across the food system, making money for themselves, offering affordable, accessible products to consumers, offering opportunities for growers to improve their incomes in the process. First up, we have a past recipient of the Sight and Life Nutrition Leadership Award, Anna Lati. <clears throat> Anna was the director of Nutrition and Food Systems Division at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations from October 2013 to December 2020, where she led FAO's work on food systems for nutrition. Currently, she's the professor of nutrition at the University of Ghana. Anna, thank you for being with us today and for framing our discussions around food systems. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, for the kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen now, um, and I hope you can all see my screen. I'm going to put it in the uh, slideshow mode. Um, good, I hope you can all see it now. Good. So um, as the, uh, I think Simon has given a good background to why we are interested in food systems. So in my presentation, I want to talk about why food systems are taking center stage for, for the changes we want to do. And I would like us to be, to be sure that we are all on the same understanding by what we mean by food systems. What are the food systems challenges and why the call for food systems transformation and what can be done? So just so we all have a good understanding of the food systems we are talking about, sorry. I would like to use this global panel framework of what we mean by food systems. On the outside, food systems have various components. It's actually very, very complex, but I'm using this simple framework. So it involves agriculture production, uh, uh, food storage transport, food transformation, retail, and all up to consumption. So it's quite a number of processes, institutions, and all involved. So food system is not just simple. Then within the food systems, we have what we call the food environment. The food environment are the spaces around us where we negotiate and actually uh, pick our foods as consumers. Now, the food environment influences us as consumers and we also influence the food environment. So the things that influence the food environment, 
you can see food labeling, food promotion, food prices. You know, when it's expensive, you are not likely to buy the quality of the food, physical access, all these will influence the consumer. Now, within the consumer, there are inherent factors that can also influence the consumer's decision making regarding food. The time, knowledge, purchasing power, and preferences. Uh, if you come for a place like Ghana, where I come from, where if you want a good meal, Ghanaian meal, it will take you at least two hours, then convenience becomes a very important factor, time and convenience, important factor in your choice of food. Now, within the food systems, I'm going down. Uh, okay. Within the food system, there are also external factors that influence the food systems. Climate change. Climate change influences food systems. Food systems will also influence climate change. I will mention it in a while. Globalization and trade, income levels, urbanization, population growth, political and economic context, and socioeconomic cultural context. All these will influence the food systems that I just talked about. Okay, so the sections, the food environment, the consumer behavior, these, depending on what happens here, will ultimately depend, uh, influence the kind of diet that consumers end up having and subsequently our uh, ability, our nutritional status and also our ability to achieve, achieve the sustainable development goals. We have had many people say that our food systems have failed, our food systems are not doing what we wanted to do. What's wrong with the food system? Well, basically we produce so much food in the world and yet we have about 690 million people who go to bed hungry. Our food systems are not delivering on the healthy diet. About 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet. I'll come to talk about it in a minute. Our food systems do not yield equitable benefits. And the clear example of this, especially for Sub-Saharan Africa, is that if you look at the people who produce food, our farmers, farmers are the poorest within the structure. You know, if you are looking at poor people, people who produce food being the poorest, and sometimes their children are malnourished. This is a food systems failure. Our food systems are not sustainable. It produces about 29% uh, uh, 20, uh, of greenhouse gas emission. And also it, there's depletion of our natural resources, land, water, energy, and loss of agrobiodiversity. And more so I want to highlight agrobiodiversity where we are losing a lot of our traditional crops, you know, as a way uh, uh, of the way we produce food. And I'm sure a lot of you can remember foods that were available to you when you were young, as young people, and now it has disappeared. So this biodiversity loss is real. So this is impacting on nutrition. I've mentioned the hunger numbers going up. Two billion people do not have access to regular nutritious food. We cannot, the world, we cannot, we are not on track to eliminate hunger. Then COVID has made it worse. I'll come to talk about COVID in a minute. And so the world is not on track to, develop, to defeat malnutrition. If you look at the situation in which we are, we really need to do something seriously and fast about our food system. Uh, if you look at the hunger numbers, you know, it's actually going up. So by 2030, instead of coming down and getting to our target, we are going to move away from our target. More people are going to be uh, under, undernourished because they will not be able to have uh, enough food to eat. Okay. Then um, this is from the State of Food Security and Nutrition Report 2020 that looked at three types of healthy diet. The energy sufficient diet, which is the diet, when you look at the diet, it's basically all carbohydrates. Hardly, you couldn't see the other aspect of the food. Then the nutrient adequate diet, which has been made adequate as a result of the addition of essential nutrients. And then you have the healthy diet, which is made up of different food groups and diversity. Truly, this is where we all want to go to, healthy diet. But this is not affordable. Even the nutrient adequate diet is not affordable to about 3 billion people in, in the world. If you look at where the distribution is, this is where the 3 billion people who cannot afford a healthy diet are located. You can see that substantially, we see more in the sub-Saharan Africa region. Now, I said COVID has made things worse. It has added on another layer of challenge. COVID has caused health crisis, food systems crisis, 
an economic crisis. Some of the crises have been as a result of the uh, mitigating measures that were put in place. And as a result, food insecurity is increasing. People have lost their livelihood. Poverty is going to increase. You can see the numbers there. And the, uh, uh, the, 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 the standing together for nutrition uh, analysis that has been done show that we are going to get additional increase in the number of wasted children, the number of stunted children, and the number of maternal anemia. So COVID is actually going to add more malnourished children. So we really have a big uh, head ahead of us. You know, we have not met our target and COVID is going to make it worse. We are still in the midst of COVID. Don't, let's not forget. Now, another problem we have is that we produce so much food, but we lose a lot of it. You know, food loss and waste is high as a result of so many factors. We put in land, water, energy, labor, produce food only to lose it because of inefficiencies, inefficiencies in our food systems. Well, so at FA, we commissioned a study to look at the uh, uh, processed food revolution in an African food system. I just want to show just one slide about what we saw in several African countries. You know, this is consumption of food away from home. Now in several countries, people are actually eating away from home more. You can see the trend. People are eating away from home. So this is what I call, we are outsourcing our nutrition to others. Others are determining our nutrition and what we eat. And there are so many things pushing this. And the major thing is time and convenience. Yeah. People want time to save time. People want convenience. So they are eating more outside the home. The question is, if we are eating more outside the home, what we need to worry about the food safety issues. The people who are producing our food, how well are they prepared to address the safety of the food that we buy on the street? So food safety issues cannot be left out about, uh, from the discussions that we are holding. Um, now, dietary risk factors have become a major cause of disease and death. Globally, malnutrition, so dietary risk factors are affecting us, both globally, even in high income countries and low income countries. The way we are eating is causing disease and death. In fact, somebody now says that the way we are eating has become the source of death. Our diet is actually killing us. We are not eating the way we should eat. So there is this call for full systems transformation. We, the aim is to transform the way the world produces food and the way we consume food. It's not just a matter of production, it's also a matter of consumption. And that's what the full, systems, uh, full system uh, transformation uh, is going to look at. How, what do we want our food systems to be? If you want a good working food system, we want a food system that is healthy for humans, so it delivers healthy diet. It is resilient. So come COVID or no COVID, our food system will be resilient. We won't see what we are going through now. It has to be equitable. Smallholder farmers, women are all getting a fair share of their input. Not that people will produce food and they will continue to be poor while the middlemen be become rich. You know, we want our food systems to be sustainable. It will be sustainable to the planet. It will protect our bio natural resources and biodiversity. It will also be efficient. Efficient. We produce the food and we retain it to do what we want it to do and not, not lose it. So ultimately, this is what we want our food systems to, to do. There are so many things we can do and we can have policies, policies to put in place to change our food system in the supply chain. We can look at production all the way to marketing. What can we do to address the inefficiencies in the food environment? There's so much we can do. Uh, look at food prices, income, cash transfers, uh, the safety of the food, the convenience, the quality, uh, uh, even city planning is very important. Sometimes where we even position access to local food is very important. Messaging such as advertising and labeling are very key in influencing what people eat. And we cannot overlook the role of women. Women play an important role in the food system. So we should think about women if we are talking about the food systems transformation. So on this note, I'd like to say a big thank you. This was just an overview to see some of the areas where we can tackle, what we can tackle 
to actually transform our food systems. On this note, I hand over to uh, Simon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I'm going to shop, stop sharing my slides. Excellent, Anna. <clears throat> Thank you so very much. That was uh, a really comprehensive and outstanding framing uh, of the challenges and some of the opportunities that we're facing um, as we look to try and build a healthier and more nutritious uh, food system for the future. Uh, sets the stage very well uh, for today's workshop. It's now my pleasure uh, to introduce our second speaker, Frida Gavin Smith, uh, from the global, who is the Global Public Health Manager at Sight and Life Foundation, to explain the Food Systems Innovation Hub concept. Frida brings a very diverse foundation of experiences to this discussion, having worked across public and private sectors, as well as in NGOs and multi-stakeholder platforms, all with a goal to improving nutritional outcomes where they're needed most. Frida, over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Simon, very much. And thank you, Anna, for framing that so, so well. And I don't know about everybody else, but the, the frame outsourcing our nutrition um, was something that, that certainly struck me. And, and I really like that phrase and, and also nicely follows on from what we're going to talk about now, which is the Food Innovations Hub. So as Simon said, I'm the Global Public Health Nutrition Manager at Sight and Life, and we're delighted when the government of Rwanda asked us to uh, support this dialogue and to talk about our innovation, which is around foods uh, systems. Okay, just one moment, everyone. My, my slides are not moving. There we go, it's, it's a bit slow. Um, so I guess I'm not going to dwell too much on these statistics. I think, like me, you probably have seen and heard them many, many times. Um, the issues around the environment, around the ability to nourish our population, which is decreasing. And also, of course, um, Anna has talked a lot about the global health challenges that's now presented with regards to both under and overweight. What I really want to talk about today is the solutions to this problem around um, developing more healthy food systems. Inside and Life, we've been over 35 years working in the area of nutrition in many different countries, many different contexts with many different partners from civil society to UN to the private sectors and also of course with governments. And what we've identified is that there are three pillars that really are required to create transformation across the food system. And we would like these three pillars to form part of this Food Systems Innovations Hub. The first is around bringing exceptional food and technology companies that have market prowess to expand into the Global South. The second is around facilitating investment in local SMEs that have the potential to scale, transfer the technology, and of course, create demand for nutritious food. And lastly, is it to stimulate innovation throughout the value chain tailored to global South markets. And we'll spend a lot of time today in two different workshops looking at this whole area of innovation. This we see as catalyzing a transformative change from developing nutritious, safe and tasty foods, increasing supply and access of food, creating demand, fostering livelihoods, enhancing regulations and improving monitoring and testing. So now you could ask, well, who needs to be involved and what do they need to do? The who regarding impact investors or who would like to invest in the food systems, we see governments, we see impact investors, we see UN agencies, all having a role in, in, in providing investment in the Food Systems Innovations Hub. With regards to the what, we wanted to pick out some key areas here. I'm not gonna go through them um, in detail, but areas around field-friendly diagnostics, nutrition ingredients, nutrition assessment, consumer insights are all required. What I really want to do now is, is to move away from kind of the conceptual concept and take you through a practical example that Sight and Life has been involved with in the number of years, for the last number of years, I should say, in Ghana, uh, called Obasama. And I want to take you through how we, we created a healthy, nutritious food the many challenges that we had and the innovations that we created to overcome those challenges. And in fact, many of these challenges that we went through was, was really the rationale for creating this idea of the Food Systems Hub, because we could see where the gaps were 
throughout the food value chain in creating affordable, nutritious foods. So Obasima is um, a quality seal that aims to increase the number of affordable, safe and nutritious fortified food products that are available in Ghana for women of reproductive age and to make them more recognizable. So how did we do this? We focused on three main areas. The first was around rich consumer insights, which we talked about before with regards to creating demand. We really wanted to understand women of reproductive age, what foods they ate, uh, how did they eat them, etc. And then we were able to create targeted marketing campaigns, which helped to increase the demand for these products. The second was the business to business solutions with local food processors. We were able to engage with DSM, who are partners in this project, and also Agiomoto, and they provided technical support to SMEs in Ghana, particularly those who have never fortified foods, who didn't potentially have the correct equipment, who didn't have knowledge around the, the safety elements, and they were able to provide capacity support. And lastly, we have a regulatory support through the front of pack seal, which is the Obasama seal. This infographic, which we will share afterwards, um, nicely sort of demonstrates what we did with Obasama with regards to it being a demand-driven approach to nutrition. We identified a nutrition need. We developed the premix with an um, internationally recognized nutrition company who then supported and built the capacity of local food companies to do it themselves, all the while creating um, a marketing campaign supporting the uptake and demand for these products. So I want to talk a little bit about now how we overcame the challenges that we, that one particular challenge that we met when we were developing Obasama. I don't have time today to talk about all of them. I don't think I, if I had a week, I probably wouldn't have enough time because there are many challenges with developing affordable, nutritious foods. That's, that's clear. But one challenge we had was that the aim of Obasama was about providing nutritious foods with a nutritious profile. And a few years into the project, we realized that many food companies were excluded from this quality seal and couldn't engage. And we asked ourselves why. And one of the reasons was that they were following a nutrition profiling system that had been developed in the global north, where cardiovascular disease, obesity, overweight, uh, diabetes, they were the key nutrition issues. But they were not the nutrition public health problems in Ghana, or indeed in Rwanda for that matter. So we worked with academics to develop a nutrition framework that could be applied to low middle income countries, where you talk about the nutrition needs in those countries, you think about the culture, and you think about the context. So we now have a framework that enables us to support governments who are asking us, well, what does a food, healthy food look like in Rwanda? Or what does it look like in Uganda? So we can take this model and adapt it to different countries. And, be, and the second most important thing as well is that we were able to bring SMEs, more SMEs into the nutrition uh, debate. So they're not all excluded. So lastly, just to leave you with this uh, proverb, which many of you know, it's a very famous African proverb. And it says, even the best cooking pot will not produce food. And I'm sure um, this resonates with me as I'm sure it does with many of you. And I know it does with many of my colleagues in Sight and Life. The reason why we have so many challenges in improving nutrition and challenges in our food system is because unfortunately no one person has the answers. And unless we make a real concerted effort to work together across sectors, across stakeholders, Within gov with governments, with private sector, with civil society, we will never have the solution or we will never see the solution to malnutrition. So I'm really excited today to really talk to local innovators in Rwanda who are all on this, uh, on this workshop to hear more about how you can engage and you can get involved in developing more affordable, nutritious foods. Thank you, Simon, over to you. Great, thanks very much, Brida. And thanks for doing such a great job of not only uh, sharing with us some examples of what good innovations can be and what they can lead to, but also the importance of and the need for um, a, a food systems innovation hub to enable this not just to be <clears throat> a one by one uh, uh, project, uh, but actually to really change the system around how innovations can be uh, brought into use uh, and, and to productive impact. Um, now, I'd like to go to our third speaker, uh, Dr. Ndaba Menye, who is working as the senior advisor to the minister in the Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Resources. 
um, in Rwanda. Uh, he is coordinating the National Food Systems Technical Team for the preparation of the UN Food Systems Summit. Among other posts, he's also worked as government senior manager at the Rwanda Agriculture and Animal Resources Development Board, uh, headed crop protection and the food security department. And he also holds a PhD in soil science and plant nutrition. Dr. Ndabamenye, we are very pleased to have you with us today. Look forward to hearing your thoughts. Over to you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this important dialogue. Let me start by thanking this, uh, the leadership of Sun and Life in the Life, Sight and the Life, for really uh, putting emphasis on the preparation of this dialogue and for the journey we did together to satisfy the, 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 the dialogues on the action track number one and two for the UN Food System Summit. So allow me to record a bit some statistics, as we said, according to some report from FAO, as my previous speaker said, we are still having a lot of number of people who are malnourished, and then we have a, a challenge that if this number continues, uh, we will be having challenges in 2030. So it is evident that we are, not, we are also concerned by healthy food from the production to the consumer stage. And we may not pass by the issue of malnutrition, which is still a big challenge in most of the countries. So there has been a challenge of a COVID pandemic who, which has exposed dangerous deficiencies in our food systems and actively threatening the lives of livelihood uh, for so many people. So therefore, we believe that transforming food systems is among strongest opportunities we have to build back better from the COVID pandemic. So for the talk of today, is a food system innovation hub among scenarios? Why Rwanda is ripe for a sustainable innovation hubs initiatives. Indeed, it sounds to be complicated, but I will be answering this question simply by presenting opportunities that Rwanda has and the national strategies and the policies towards agricultural transformation. Of course, bearing in mind that not only are food system complex, but each is also unique to the geography and the culture it is supposed to nourish. This is very important when we talk about regionalization of, of, of agriculture. Let me summarize it in three pillars. The first one, eradicating malnutrition is a priority for Rwanda. The second one, bringing expertise and the modern technology to a pro-business environment, and the third one, Rwanda's regulatory framework. Indeed, eradicating malnutrition is a priority. Rwanda has developed strategies, plans, and the pathways to eradicate malnutrition, mostly stunting, and there is a good progress which is made in the areas of food security and nutrition for the last decade. So we have some successes, success stories to be carried out for other countries. Crop intensification program through land use consolidation, because most of our farmers, they have a small piece of land. This land use consolidation was with the geographical suitable priority crops. And this program was complemented by livestock intensification program. And those significantly improved food security from 16% to 81% during the last decade. And it has to reach around 90% in five years coming. So at the moment, around 33 of the Rwandan's children under five years of age are to be stunted, but this number should be around 19 by 2025. And by three, 2050, we have the Rwandan vision 2050. So through food system transformation, of course, we believe that sustainable production and the productivity to ensure that all Rwandans have access to affordable nutritious food by leveraging modern technologies and upgraded agricultural infrastructure 
mostly to reduce food losses. We have been looking that the food losses is a big challenge, food waste, and ensuring food safety, all of those are among the priorities. So there is a need to scale up, of course, uh, to scale out uh, agroecological production systems by addressing the knowledge gaps, adjusting incentives, and improving access to finance while boosting the seed and the fertilizer local production industries. So we have also to leverage commercial farming and there's also commercial farming should be driven by research and innovation, mostly in Rwanda putting more emphasis on smart irrigation and the precision agriculture. So let me talk about the nutritious food. In Rwanda, significant effort was devoted in addressing issues of high price, high prices of nutritious food through promotion of a nutrition program to improve access to, to nutrients and, and, and improve livelihood, reduce shocks and vulnerability, but most importantly, ensuring that no one to be left behind. I can give some examples. School feeding program is among the priorities. Earlier child development centers at the local level for child feeding, one cup per poor family, which is also a bigger program, one cup of milk per child, and they have been also promoting some nutri nutrition sensitive agriculture pro programs to promote more diverse set of nutrient rich food that can be consumed at the same time being traded. Most importantly also in Rwanda, we have been embarking on the risking private sector investment in food production through investing in agri business hubs to make it easier for a private sector to invest in food production. I think this is also fitting with the mandate of innovation hub. We have some examples where we have, for instance, in Eastern province, irrigation hub aiming at increasing yield significantly, reducing impact on balance of payments via local, via local sourcing of food for processing and increasing employment in agriculture. So last but not least, we have been putting a very strong legislative framework, which is pro nutrition and a promote health that uh, in our context. We have for some examples, different government agencies. Here we have Rwanda Food and the Drug Authority. And we are also putting more emphasis on laws, uh, regulating marketing of unhealthy food, as well as uh, putting a legal framework for the surveillance programs, increasing the capacity of our laboratories, increasing the capacity of infrastructures, but at the same time, putting more emphasis on the food safety systems index. We do, we do this because we have to make sure that we are reducing the prevalence of aflatoxin. Also, we are reducing the, the, the problems of export rejection due to poor quality of produce. So in view of the above, Rwanda has a high level of commitments towards food system transformation and the culture of excellence, integrity, and a sense of urgency to deliver. So indeed, food system national dialogues have been an opportunity to explore how future food systems related to the full range of sustainable development goals, as well as other continental commitment, but still implementation framework is still under exploration. That's why we are welcoming the innovation it has. So therefore, all of those above milestones testimony the possibility of food system transformation through innovation hubs that will require a concerted effort between different key players in our, car, in our, in our context to have a sustainable Rwanda's food system transformation. So I thank you very much for your attention. Over. Thank you so much, Dr. Telesco. Um, really interesting to hear all the progress that's already being made in Rwanda, and yet uh, your recognition that there's still a lot more uh, strengthening, a lot more integration of all the elements of uh, the innovation system uh, for stronger food systems and so on that is still needed to be brought together. Now, uh, we're moving uh, to a panel, uh, a panel of entrepreneurs 
who's going to discuss the trials and tribulations behind innovating, affordable, tasty, and nutritious foods and food system solutions that can uh, lead to the futures that we're hearing are so important from our speakers. I'm going to hand the moderation task now to Kalpana from Sight and Life. But before I do, Kalpana, I would like you to answer a question. In your experience, what is the key factor that can help us drive innovation? Kalpana, over to you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, what an apt question to start our fireside chat with experts on entrepreneurship in Rwanda. Uh, so to answer your question, Simon, having spent two decades on innovations as an entrepreneur, engineer, investor, and now as a practitioner through Saturn Life, uh, especially through the innovation hubs, I think it takes more than one key factor for innovations to scale in emerging economies such as Rwanda. And specifically, I would say there are three factors, what we call as the three C's. And the three C's are creativity, capacity building, and uh, collaboration. Um, as you know, no, entrepreneurs are extremely creative and market savvy, but in emerging economies where the enabling system is so suboptimal, uh, the entrepreneurs have to create the conditions that will enable their venture to operate successfully. And these enablers would often include building uh, capacity building in other players all along the value chain that affects their business, whether they are vendors or whether it's customers, retailers, and so on. And they have to collaborate uh, with the social sector, such as the NGOs and the government to be able to make sure the venture uh, functions smoothly. So unlike the entrepreneurs in high income nations, the three C's, creativity, capacity building and collaboration are the foundation for innovations to be successful in low and middle income countries. So let's see um, what our panel has to say. Uh, first, it's an honor to welcome uh, Dr. Namukolo Kovic from um, IFPRI. And Dr. Namukolo has a, is a close friend of Sight and Life. We worked with her on Sight and Life's Elevator Pitch Contest, uh, which is a platform for young innovators and entrepreneurs. And we were very impressed uh, when Namukolo trained and mentored a number of them um, in a previous contest. Namukulu brings diverse experience and a wealth of knowledge in all aspects of uh, nutrition. Welcome, Namukulu. We also Thank have- Thank you very much. We also have uh, Joseph Neomukwiza uh, from Green Rev joining us today. Uh, Joseph is a young entrepreneur in the food sector. He's a founder of Green Rev, a social enterprise that's working with smallholder farmers to develop nutritious products locally in Rwanda. And to date, Green Rev has impacted more than 8 million people in East Africa, as was recently reported uh, by the UN Sustainable Development Solution Report. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you. Um, and finally, our third panelist for today is Dr. Kizito Nishimbe from Economic Policy and Research Network in Rwanda. And for the last 10 years, Dr. Nishimbe has been innovating on food safety and post-harvest management. He recently won the, a few years ago, he won the Sight and Life Award on Aflatoxin Control Challenge in Africa um, through, again, through our a pitch contest platform, which is designed to support innovators. Welcome, Dr. Kizito. Thank you. So the get started, uh, Dr. Kizito, with your expertise in food systems in Rwanda, why do you believe uh, Rwanda is ideal for entrepreneurship? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Kalpana. So uh, maybe I may introduce a little bit myself. My name is Kizito Nishime. Apart from being member of EPRN, I'm also rector at the University of Rwanda. Is this is what I wanted to just highlight that I'm also uh, rector at the University of Rwanda. Uh, uh, come to your your question. Why do we think that nature's nature's food should be part of internal partnership here in Rwanda? Uh, Here's the context, it has been highlighted so that we are seeing now food system shifting and then going to urbanization, which means we are seeing more distance between the farmer and then the consumer, which means has been highlighted by the first presenter. So someone at a certain point is controlling now the safety of our food. Just to highlight what I'm really saying, uh, Let's just take, you mentioned that aflatoxin. Let's just put now aflatoxins as an example. 
You can see aflatoxins, they are toxins produced by these fungi uh, under poor agricultural uh, and storage conditions. So they have really a big impact you know, on public health because they are associated with a river cancer, but also the, the most of mm. recent studies, they have shown that you no know, aflatoxins contamination are also linked with negative growth, growth outcomes. So from the, rest, the recent study conducted by the Feed the Future Nutrition Innovation Lab in Uganda showed that the pregnant women with a high level of aflatoxin exposure had low, low uh, rate. Uh, low rate of gestational weight gain. So this is on nutrition part, but if you see now in terms of trade, you will see no longer like in the March last this year, we have seen now challenges um, in trade between Uganda and uh, Kenya because of now, because of aflatoxin contamination in the trade. So beyond now being a really a public health importance, now aflatoxins are somehow part of now the, the trade. So, which means we need entrepreneurship. And then for to come to this, uh, to this, uh, uh, your question, what kind of technologies or innovation do we need or are available? So it has been highlighted that the, the one of the biggest part is ROS. For instance, for CEOs, it has been estimated between 14 to 30%. So we cannot keep increasing now the production Rather, the one of the solution, it is start now thinking, how can we reduce now losses? So it's where now entrepreneurship now component, we come into the game. So there are a couple of innovations around. I will mention a few in terms of now this food safety and aflatoxins. Uh, some, we need some innovations, but also affordable for small scale farmers, because otherwise it will never work. For, for instance, we have hermetic storages, which are there for a long period. They have been developed now for the last 10 years. So, but see now, even though we have this kind of innovation, so we are seeing a retail level of adoption by farmers. And then why? Maybe the key solution just to link now between the, these innovations and then farmers, we need, we need entrepreneurs. So who will be reaching out now these farmers and then promoting all this innovation which are around. So not to mention another technology which is related to food safety and then aflatoxins, they are these dry cuts. Are they available to farmers? Because they have been produced and then they are raw cost. Why not really available to farmers? Maybe the key solution from this, it's now a start now engaging entrepreneurs just to be part of now the food systems. Not only we have researchers and innovators over there, and then we have farmers on the other corner. So we need to bring them together. It's where uh, now entrepreneurs will, will be part of the game. So thank you. Over. Thank you, Dr. Kizito. That's a great answer. Now we move to uh, Namukolo. Namukolo, in your experience, uh, what's the most significant challenge that entrepreneurs struggle with right now? And how can, and how can uh, food systems innovation hubs help or support entrepreneurs over this hurdle? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kalpana. Actually, there are several hurdles that entrepreneurs are facing. Um, the first one is lack of resources to try out new ideas. And so even when they have good ideas, they don't have access to resources such as venture capital or startups to, to get those ideas going. So the Food Systems Innovation Hub can actually help lift them across this particular hurdle. The second hurdle is that of issues around um, inconsistencies with energy supply. And so if somebody has an enterprise that requires uh, 
regular energy input, then they run into problems of failing to deliver products on time because they are not able to produce consistently over time. Again, an effort where I think the food systems innovation hub can find ways of addressing this, perhaps through clustering of entrepreneurs. The third is the inconsistent supply of good quality raw materials. And, and here, it's really an issue of economies of scales, them not being able, uh, first of all, the resources limitations do not allow them to buy in, in large bulk, but also the quality of the raw materials is not, cannot be uh, ascertained uh, consistently. So again, through clustering of entrepreneurs, in some way, perhaps the food systems innovation hub can help. Then there is the issue of cash flow constraints. Uh, we do find sometimes entrepreneurs that have very good ideas, they have perhaps delivered an order, and then it takes a while, a couple of months perhaps, to get the, um, the payments done. And during that time, then they run out of cash flows to continue sustaining their business before they get their payments. And this hinders them from delivering the next, uh, the next uh, batch of products. And really, looking at all these, I, I, I want to also borrow from the term, I think, uh, that Brenda brought up of uh, the fact that even the best uh, pot cannot uh, produce food. And here, I really want to tie to the fact that we want our entrepreneurs to produce good food for us to, to, to support good nutrition. And therefore, these innovation hubs should also find a way of linking our entrepreneurs to uh, dietary guidelines so that as they produce new products, it's not just food products, but good nutritious food products that can actually help for the, these ultimate goal of providing better diets for the consumers. I think those are some that I can uh, put forward now. I can write a book about this. So let me stop here for now. Thank you, uh, Kalpana. No, thank you, Namko. Closely follow you on social media. Uh, all the insights you've, you've been sharing, especially on nutrition of very valuable food entrepreneurs. Thank you. Now we go move to our young entrepreneur on the panel, Joseph. Joseph, from your uh, experience as an entrepreneur, what resources are most important for entrepreneurs and food systems, especially to develop innovative, but also good food nutritious products that Namkulo was talking about? Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. And uh, I think the first we start with the primary agriculture. Uh, infrastructure is required in primary agriculture. Infrastructure is uh, needed in primary agriculture, especially for in Rwanda. Uh, primary agriculture is uh, so that, uh, especially in seeds and the fertilizers. But where the different comes in is on the, in the harvest activities and the post harvest activities. Uh, farmers, they produce their crops, but uh, when it comes to the harvest activities and the post harvest activity, is where the nutrition gets lost from. So I think what entrepreneurs need most is uh, infrastructures like uh, cold storage and uh, other storage for dry product. And I think also transportation, especially for horticulture sector. And uh, another thing is that uh, entrepreneurs, they are there and they have different ideas, as Namukoro said, but uh, they don't have access to infrastructure. For instance, how or can I know that uh, the product I'm producing is uh, of good, nutrition or is a quality of uh, quality nutrition. Uh, there it comes, I need the laboratory to test my product, which is not available for small scale farmers and uh, SMEs. I think if at all we can uh, in the Auto system innovation hub, they can establish different laboratories where they we have nutritionists and food scientists 
to assist those innovators with their ideas. Because the creativity, uh, SMEs have, they are creative, but their creativity will not, will not reach anywhere without the support from nutritionists and the uh, food scientists, which will bring in those laboratories. Another thing is that, especially here in Rwanda, for SMEs, they don't have access to Remix 6. Uh, Remix is, 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 a, is a case here in Rwanda. I don't think there is a, a local seller who can provide the Remix 6. Uh, I try to reach everywhere uh, through my researches. Maybe if uh, there is one can tell me, but uh, I reach to Rwanda FDA. They told me there is none. So we need to report the Remix 6. So even if those infrastructures are, will, be, will be made available in Rwanda without the raw materials like the premixes, I think it will also be a challenge to, to develop a good nutritious product. Uh, so by then, uh, we need to have a local supplier, a local retailer who can be providing us premixes in the sector. Great. Thank you, Joseph. And it's fantastic to hear. And it goes back to tying to uh, Namukola's point that economies of scale is what actually makes, it, makes entrepreneurship to be successful in Rwanda. And, um, and I'm hearing a couple of points on where the hubs, innovation hubs can support. One is that you, you mentioned, all three of you mentioned creative solutions exist, but there's several hurdles. There's infrastructure, there is inconsistencies, whether it's raw materials, energy, or cash flow constraints, lack of resources, um, and then what you need is a platform where you can collaborate, uh, whether it's through clustering of entrepreneurs or to access technical support to make good food products, uh, but also um, raw materials. So thank you so much for your uh, encouraging remarks on what the innovation hubs could do. And I would like to wrap up the discussion with one final question to each one of you. In, in, in about a, one minute, if you could provide advice for aspiring entrepreneurs in six words or less. Namukola, let's, let's start with you. Yeah, I think our entrepreneurs don't always reach out to our academic institutions. And our academic institutions are always looking for projects for their students. So reach out and ask them to try out things for you because that is a cost effective way of doing it without having to lay out uh, resources that you need to, to try your product. So that's what I would advise. Reach out to our local academic institutions and then the local academic institutions. Let's also reach out to help our entrepreneurs innovate. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Namukuro. Dr. Kizito, your six. Uh, so, yeah, I will go in the same way what Namukuro just said is much more than what I said previously. We have innovators and then we have farmers. So, what is the bridge uh, between the two? We have entrepreneurs. So, what I might advise to entrepreneurs is now maybe start now collaborating with the innovators, with the researchers, because innovations are there. Maybe they may be not enough, but they have to start now cooperating with them so that they can scaling up all this innovation, then reach out to the farmers. Because the most of the time, researchers, they don't have enough funds to go to scaling up now these innovations. So it's up to entrepreneurs to start now bridging this gap between innovators and then farmers. Over to Thank you. you. Thank you, collaborations and bridging the gap. And finally, Joseph, your six words. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, farmers and uh, those uh, institutions can really, but uh, I think if uh, there's uh, this system of uh, taking maybe graduates, have them somewhere, then link them with the farmers so that they can be assisted. And uh, uh, meanwhile, I think uh, if uh, we take the consumers, if entrepreneurs can refuse consumers to, to take an healthy product, and uh, there is no way to make that possible, apart from enabling entrepreneurs to produce quality, nutritious product. 
Super. Thank you, Joseph. With that, a round, a round of applause to our three experts in entrepreneurship. Back to you, Simon. Great. Thanks, Kalpana. Thanks to our great uh, panelists there for some very inspiring and uh, very, uh, let's say, locally specific um, recommendations and insights. Um, at the end of the day, this kind of system approach has to land into a place and land into specific uh, products and um, innovations in the local context. And I think we got a great stimulus uh, for further discussion now in the next session. So now we're going to move into the breakouts. Um, great. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you had as interesting discussions in your breakouts as uh, we did in ours. I ended up staying in the Innovation 2 breakout. We had uh, lots of good contributions. So very briefly, we're now going to summarize uh, for everybody's benefits what was heard uh, in each of the breakouts. And each of our breakout leads will have three minutes um, to do their summary uh, before we then move on to the next one. So first up, we have uh, Shrujit Langlada, Site and Life Manager of Technology. Shrujit, over to you. Great. Thanks, Simon. Um, we've had a very interesting discussion on the challenges and innovations that are required for uh, two specific stakeholders. Uh, smallholder farmers and SMEs and the consumers. And what really came um, out striking for me in terms of like, you know, the smallholder farmers and the SMEs is really the need for aggregation, uh, the need for all of, you know, to be able to bring the smallholder farmers together and, uh, 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 and so that a lot of the challenges are, um, are, are, um, uh, are um, kind of like mitigated in terms of, for example, I can give you the example of insurance, a smallholder farmer for him to get an insurance or access to finance is so difficult, but when it becomes a cooperative, when it becomes a group, um, banks are more willing to listen. Um, governments are willing to listen, policy makers are willing to listen, and insurance companies are willing to listen. So I thought that was very uh, interesting. And secondly, um, and, uh, a lot of the barriers that um, consumers face going to the consumer side is all about, um, you know, even if I today as a consumer make the decision to eat healthy, I wouldn't really know if I went to a supermarket what's, nutrition, what's nutritious food and what nourishes me. Um, that's one thing, and uh, also an information gap, but also the innovation to be able to take um, uh, the, 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 the cue of making our nutritious foods affordable, but also very aspirational, um, uh, taking that cue from marketing chains like be, be it your um, marketing MNCs who make foods so aspirational. I think that's that's going to be a key innovation for us to be able to market uh, nutritious foods. Uh, I'll stop here, but I think the uh, discussion was very helpful and very uh, critical uh, with key takeaways for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thanks so much for keeping to time as well. That was really great to have that uh, tight summary. Uh, Kalpana, over to you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, the innovation uh, breakout session group two uh, followed the same framework as, as group one, the same set of questions. Um, and so just uh, all the uh, problems and challenges that the innovations uh, face uh, to scale or to sustain in the one that are very group. But you'll, and uh, maybe I'll share a couple of solutions that we discussed. Uh, one is uh, the power of the sun, the sun, a renewable source of energy. How can we talk about, we talked about cold storage, uh, solar solutions, which are solar powered. How do we make sure that uh, uh, tested, uh, made accessible, but also scaled uh, in Rwanda? Then we, um, then we give the example of the small and the mighty uh, insects, the use of insects as a protein for feed um, to improve uh, or to lower the cost of production of uh, livestock derived foods such as dairy um, and fish. Uh, but also uh, keep our uh, oceans uh, from being overfished. Uh, and the second area is all around uh, capacity building and collaboration. Um, Simon gave a, an excellent example of our, of our farm to market alliance and also uh, Acre Africa, which is present in Rwanda, where there are index-based um, insurance solutions uh, available for smallholders. 
Uh, and it goes back to the point of what Sujit was saying that we need uh, this aggregation or grouping of farmers. Uh, and one of the participants, uh, Daniel, uh, explained in detail of, of the relevance of having a third institution, such as, say, for example, in this case, an innovation hub that can act as a collateral um, or provide financial uh, support so that uh, because smallholders really cannot, will not have the collateral uh, to, uh, to take on the loans. Um, and another, uh, that we talked about, about uh, bridging the gaps between smallholders um, and the companies in the markets and the role of policymakers uh, and, and the government uh, to be able to uh, bridge those gaps. Um, and finally, um, one critical uh, factor for improving farmers' access uh, to innovations is having community-based agents, especially uh, entrepreneurs who can help with the delivery of innovations, finance, insurance, inputs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and with that, I think the innovation, the food systems innovation hubs are in a, in a strategic position to offer a platform for, uh, for these creative solutions to come together, build capacity where it's needed, uh, but also find linkages or collaborators uh, for all food system actors. Over to you, Simon. Great, thanks, Kavana. Uh, really, really uh, good um, summary um, of a dynamic discussion. Um, I think we're now gonna go to Maya on, uh, no, we're gonna go to Daniel. Uh, I see the screen has come up for Daniel. Okay, uh, so Daniel, over to you uh, for food safety uh, summary, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Simon. Um, so we, we went deep dive into food safety and looked at aflatoxins, um, some of the mitigation um, options. And um, most of the things that came up, I think would also tie in back to what Shrujit and Kapana have already mentioned, um, working with cooperatives. So Kizito uh, was quite strong on that, that we need um, the, the, the entrepreneurs to to work on, let's say, for example, drying for smallholder farmers. So we also looked at some of the challenges that there was um, um, on the ground. We realized that technology transfer um, wasn't that um, fast or rapid. Um, when you look at aflatoxin testing, um, there was also the high cost of the testing, uh, which is around $180. Um, and we also explained that the type of equipment being used um, makes the cost um, quite high. So we're looking at how to uh, bring in more um, text kits that will make the, the testing quite accessible at the farm gates, um, at um, aggregator level, and then also um, at the, the borders. And also using these test kits will make it quite rapid and cheaper. Um, there was also the issue about uh, lack of knowledge dissemination. For example, um, the WFP has piloted um, a hermetic seal packaging in Rwanda but that hasn't triggered down to, to every farmer. Some of the farmers do not know about it, some do, um, but the scale is quite small. And there was also the, um, the, the, the development of a cob model where the um, aggregators buy on the cobs instead of just buying grains. And this was really, really, or it has been successful because it helps the um, aggregators to dry quickly um, and then reduce the aflatoxins levels. Um, there was also the um, issue with regards to innovations, you know, um, currently we're talking about some binders that are used in animal feed. Let's not forget that aflatoxins, um, when consumed by animals, becomes aflatoxin M1 in milk um, and other um, produce. So innovations with regards to use of binders um, has been piloted on a very small scale by um, Novak, which is um, um, supplied by DASF, and it has also been approved by the EU. I'm also well aware that uh, the other companies like Biomin, who are also into the same space, so we'd also be looking at that um, with the Food System Innovation Hub to bring that technology also to uh, Rwanda. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daniel. Um, uh, over to Maya uh, for a discussion about demand creation. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, so group four was focusing on demand creation for nutritious foods. It was quite a uh, you know a healthy discussion because um, we tried to look at the the biggest what are the pain points and how can we address that um, you know at a national level. 
so some of the challenges that were presented uh, include uh, the nutritious foods that you know are supposed to be popularized are quite expensive in nature and this actually hinders a lot of consumers from um, getting access to these products so consumers tend to opt for cheaper foods or different alternatives in comparison to the healthier options. However, people are also becoming health conscious. Um, so the question is, how do we make sure that the health conscious individuals are getting access um, to these to these um, high quality foods or highly nutritious foods? At the same time, there are other challenges in regards to perception of the consumers, um, and these need to be addressed in order to remove these uh, the incorrect ideologies that uh, are there for certain healthy foods. An example that was given was. Um, there is a direct correlation between um, eating uh, orange flesh, uh, orange flesh, the sweet potato, and children having diarrhea as a result of the consumption. So these are just perceptions that are, that are there for certain healthy foods, um, but they haven't yet been addressed, and this can actively hinder access to healthy foods at a national level. Most importantly, are uh, the solutions. How can we solve the, the, the challenge of um, creating demand? Um, and we feel that this, or the group felt that this is something that uh, requires a private public partnership. So um, private sector has to work hand in hand um, with the government to come up with solutions in order to address demand creation. Um, in fact, one of the questions or the, one of the first um, issues that was mentioned by um, the doctor was, who actually creates demand? Um, whose responsibility is it to create demand? And our group felt that this is something that private, it has to be a collaboration between the private and the uh, public sector directly. Um, so there should be some sort of incentivized uh, mechanism for enterprises to ensure that they can offer good packaging for their foods because Rwanda, as you may know, um, cannot use uh, plastics, uh, but at the same time, it might be challenging to package these goods um, and put them on the shelves and make it attractive enough for the consumers. So that is something that needs to be addressed. Other things that need to also be considered include um, uh, supporting the enterprise through different social marketing and awareness campaigns. Again, uh, this is not something that can be afforded by the enterprises on the ground, but if it is also you know, uh, received by, you know, if this is taken on by the government to go out and actively educate consumers on the need to um, consume healthy foods, it might create a bigger impact on driving demand. Uh, lastly, one of the things that was mentioned that was also very important is without awareness, it cannot lead to investment opportunities. So we need to make sure that that, um, you know, the, the motivation towards awareness is created at a national level, and this can drive uh, enterprises or different investors to come into the market. Last but not least, and what is most important is affordability. If it, it is very, very essential that the products that are offered, especially the healthy foods, are made available. Um, but I will, and I believe that, or should I say, the group believes that advocacy is key. Uh, for us to afford to to ensure affordability, uh, so I will leave advocacy for the next group to take on um, in the further discussions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Maya. Uh, we are now at time. If people need to leave, obviously that's understood. If you can stay for another three four minutes, uh, I think we'll have time just to uh, go through the last session uh, on policy and then a very brief wrap up from uh, Dr. Klaus Kramer. Um, Elvis, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, so uh, our group five was uh, tasked to look at uh, the policy, I mean, the advocacy and, uh, and the policy that can uh, uh, contribute to access and affordability of uh, nutritious uh, food here in Uganda. So uh, one of the things that uh, we decided to take away was that we need to link up food production to nutritious foods, that uh, key role that should be uh, put in place like policies that uh, enables entrepreneurs yeah. to reach out to, uh, to academia to and the academic institution to play a very big role and important role you know, so in the in the production and also we look at that uh, food policies should uh, change food environment this is was uh, that for a, for a, for a, for a government for for africa or rwanda in particular that there is a huge huge uh, need for government to invest in research that people research 
uh, about African, uh, traditional African uh, diets that uh, within those diets, we definitely have uh, healthier, uh, healthy foods that can also contribute. We also looked at the access of, uh, of funding. How can uh, funds be access to, to you know, young people and, and women who are uh, making up a big uh, part of our population, how they can uh, access funds that uh, sometimes are there, but it's very difficult for them to, to access. So we look at that uh, we need to advocate for policies that uh, enables them to be in cooperatives, to be in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in communities that uh, can uh, uh, facilitate their, their access to, 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 to funds. We also uh, discussed that uh, Food System Innovation Hub can uh, play a very big role to bring more youth, more, more uh, people who are now not very active in the food system to, to play a key, a key role. We also look at uh, what can be done at the policy level as incentives to, to SMEs to be able to produce uh, 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 nutritious foods. So we, we, we discussed that it's very important to, to look at the taxation regimes in place. And one of them that's being a challenge is uh, VAT. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Simon. Great. Thank you very much, Elvis. Um, so uh, just before I uh, hand over to class for the final remarks, um, just a couple of reflections from my side. Uh, first of all, this has been an excellent discussion. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join today. Uh, lots of really great contributions, and I, I guess uh, my one takeaway is there's a huge groundswell of support within Rwanda for the Food System Innovation Hub concept and the ideas uh, behind it, and then some detailing and specification. For me, there's probably one most important word um, that comes out of today, uh, and that is a, a role that the hub can play in coordination. Um, and that coordination is needed, whether it's uh, around public and private efforts to drive behavior change for consumers, uh, as we heard, is so important to move towards healthier diets, um, uh, more nutritious diets. Uh, it's coordination along, along the value chain. So that turns into demand, which can then drive innovation through the value chains. It's coordination at a geographic level, uh, connecting farmers in rural areas to cities where that growing demand uh, and changing demand is happening. It's coordination across the different stages of innovation from research and pilots uh, through proofs of concept, uh, through to the market and getting investors and financiers on board with what's needed in order to get those innovations scaled. It's coordination of the innovations themselves that in individually things like insurance or uh, hermetically sealed bags, you know, won't fly unless they're bundled together with other things that enable them to uh, be adopted by the, the users. Um, and then finally, it's coordination between entrepreneurs and the private sector and the governments uh, in particular to uh, ensure that the policy environment and the regulatory frameworks, as we just heard from Elvis, uh, are strengthened uh, and support this uh, overall change. And that requires, uh, obviously, effective coordination, then requires a lot of communication. It requires a lot of trust building. It requires alliances to come together of multiple different stakeholders. And I think the, the hub concept can really lean in and support all of that. So uh, that's my summary. <laughs> now, Klaus, uh, over to you to, to close today's discussion. Thank you very much. So thank you, Simon, for your fantastic summary. And thank you for so expertly moderating this session on building healthy, nutritious, and affordable food systems for Rwanda through innovations. Access to affordable, safe, nutritious, healthy diets, and as we also heard uh, several times, uh, for, uh, in addition to that, uh, aspirational diets, will be crucial to achieving all the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And in order to reach the SDG goals by 2030, all relevant stakeholders, the government, the private sector, consumers, civil society, academia, and donors and investors have to come together, step up and transform food systems to provide nutrition for all. And in my conviction, a food systems innovation hub in Rwanda will play a catalytic role 
to make the food system more nutritious, resilient, equitable, and just, and most importantly, leaving no one behind. We have more than 70% of food coming from small and medium-sized enterprises. Through that, the private sector with in well-defined parameters has a very important role to play to solve malnutrition in all its forms and provide, of course, job opportunities for the next generation. The government should build an enabling environment for capacity building and investments in agriculture and nutrition and define the parameters through incentives and disincentives for the private sector. For instance, it can be through public procurement for schools, as you have heard today, support of fish and egg production for more diverse diets, or tax breaks for vitamin and mineral premixes to fortify staples. Demand for nutritious food may be created through public sector driven behavior change communication, engaging the private sector, and ideally linked to a certified quality seal on the label to clearly identify nutritious and safe food items in stores. And the government is also ideally suited to bring different stakeholders together. The scaling up nutrition business network is a case in point. The Rwandan Sun Business Network will be meeting shortly for the first time. Academia has an important role to play in providing the evidence base for policies and train the next generation workforce. Civil society should drive greater accountability across the broader systems, as well as to advocate for policies and culturally appropriate programs which promote good nutrition, health, and well being for all. Donors and investors should finance the creation of an enabling environment and demand generation and provide loans at reasonable interest rates to the private sector. Food systems innovation hubs are a bold new initiative that will accelerate innovation. It will streamline processes and support nature positive biodiverse agriculture to better nourish the nations and communities they serve. Please join us in this coordinated effort to improve the world's food systems. We welcome you to bring your unique skills and resources to bear in helping solve these unique challenges. We really appreciate everyone sharing the time and valuable insights with us today. Thank you all for joining and really enjoy the rest of your day.